Yeah, so I get to work at NASA at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. But I kind of have a, a unusual background uh, road to get there. Uh, I went to an art school, it's called Art Center College of Designs in Pasadena, and I studied graphic design. And I, I did a project with a little grocery store called Galco's, and they sell 500 kinds of soda. You're, you remember that, right? Okay. So they sell 500 kinds of soda, but they're all in glass bottles. And the glass bottle makes it taste better, and they also use sugar canes of corn syrup. Uh, so the bottle is the essence of this place. And I was struggling doing what a normal graphic designer does, which is create a logo. And I was trying to do that, and this, uh, my, uh, my professor was this old Chinese fellow, that uh, really brilliant person. He said, uh, Dan, you're trying to be too practical. You um, have all this practical knowledge in your head, and it keeps you in a box. And he said, you need to just go play. And I was like, I don't know about that. You know, I don't know if I can just go play. And he said, you're so practical that you'll take the impractical stuff that you create and make it practical in some way. So I started to play around with bottles. And um, you know, one thing I was interested in is the way the bottles make noise as you blow on them. But I thought you know, maybe I could use a car as the way of blowing. Uh, that didn't work. And I was um, you know, trying different versions of this. And these didn't work either. But <laughs> eventually, I got the right angle and the right distance. And it made this beautiful noise and go woo, 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 woo. And uh, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there was a taco truck stand that drove around and made music like this, just like an ice cream truck. And uh, then I have a friend who has perfect pitch, and she went around to all the bottles and, and made this musical scale. And I don't know anything about music, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool to make a pipe organ? And uh, so this is the way my life usually runs, is that I have no idea how to do anything that I do. But I'm really good at networking. I ask lots of questions, and I ask all the simple, stupid questions uh, that I find out later on is actually a, a good way of figuring things out. So it's a little odd that uh, I, I ended up showing this to an artist that was working at Caltech. And uh, he said, great, you're going to do the same thing here, except you're going to come up with new ways of visualizing data. And uh, it, it's a whole other story. I ended up swimming like an otter for half an hour a day, and that was part of my job. Uh, we can talk about that some other time. But eventually, it led me to this place. And so this is the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, there's 5,000 people working on amazing things, anything from uh, satellites that go around the Earth that look at the, the land and the sky and the sea to uh, looking at stars and galaxies far, far away to going to other planets and, and landing on them, as uh, hopefully a number of you guys uh, had seen this. This was the Curiosity landing uh, last August. And so this is a place that I like to say we do things that are on the edge of possibility. And that's really inspiring for someone like me who, who likes to think that way. Uh, but normally, this is the way you get to a place like this. And uh, you know, many of the 5,000 people took this route. You know, they were smart in high school, they were smart in college, and then smart in, you know, further up in the college ranks. Um, I didn't have that path. I went a different way, and, and I didn't do all that well in high school. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm not exactly proud of this. It was because I didn't have a passion when I was in school. There was nothing I was really passionate about, and so it didn't really matter. But eventually, I, uh, well, you know, I didn't take the SATs either, so that was kind of funny. Um, I ended up going to this art school, and, and kind of going through this process, I realized that I did have a passion. And the passion was to be able to create moments in people's lives where they uh, have a, a moment of awe about the universe that we live in. And so after that, you know, I, I, I was uh, trying to get a hold of uh, the director of JPL. I had a tour, and, and he said we could talk sometime, but he, he's not an easy person to get a hold of. And so I sent my resume in a gigantic envelope, and uh, he didn't know exactly what to do with it, but he, he kind of gave it to some other people. And, and uh, they didn't really know what to do with me either. And they said, you know, maybe you could do animations for us, because we need animations. And, and uh, I said, you know, this is an amazing place. I'll do what whatever to work here, but, but my passion is, you know, see this bottle project? This is like what I'm really passionate about. <laughs> and I know that may not be the best way to get a job because, uh, you know, he could have very easily have just said, you know, whatever, you know, we don't need someone like you around here. Um, but he, uh, and we, this is a very important point in my life because I just graduated from, uh, from college, uh, from Art Center, which is very expensive. Uh, my wife uh, had just had a baby. She wasn't working. And, um, and I, I was looking for this unusual job. Uh, 
But he said, uh, I don't understand exactly what you do, but you have six months and we'll see what happens. And that's 10 years ago now. And so when I first got there, um, there were these um, uh, missions that we were building that were about trying to find planets around other stars. And that's just mind-blowing. And they'd give me all these numbers about being able, to, we should be able to find an Earth-like planet out there somewhere. And, and um, I'm not all that great with numbers. So, so <laughs> I thought, you know, I need to create something for me to actually understand it. And so uh, if you have a, a grain of sand, and that represents one galaxy, we live in the Milky Way galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. You need six rooms full of sand to show all the galaxies that we know about. Now, uh, I'd have a bunch of sand, and, and uh, under a magnifying glass, I'd have a single grain of sand, which represents our galaxy. And what's cool about being at a place like JPL is that uh, I could go to someone and say, could you drill a hole into a grain of sand for me? <laughs> and they could, so that was really cool. So, so this, is, uh, this is our galaxy, and this hole represents where we found hundreds and hundreds of planets around other stars so far. 90, 98% of the planets that we found around other stars have all been found within that little area. In the past 10 years, they found more a little bit further out. But, um, so, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit of perspective. This is another installation that deals with uh, planet finding. I'll let you read a little bit from this. So the basic idea is that stars are really big and bright, and the things that you're looking for are really small and dim. So I have a really bright projector and a really dim projector, and the really bright projector is projecting something that sort of feels like a, a sun or a star. And when you walk up to it, you only see that pattern. That's all it is, and people don't know what it is, but invariably, people can't stop themselves from doing shadow puppets. So they jump out there, <laughs> they do shadow puppets, and then they realize that there's something there. And I, I love that about science as well as you know, any sort of investigation is that there's lots of things that we can't see but actually exist. And you just need either the right technology or the right mindset to see it. And so what's fun about this is that people are only able to find a little tiny bit of it and uh, they're kind of forced to go find more and more people to see the rest of it. Uh, for the last few years, I've been working with a mission called Juno. Juno is a spacecraft that launched in August, and it's on its way to Jupiter right now. And uh, I've gotten to do various things with them. Uh, this is an installation that, um, uh, so Jupiter is a giant storm. There's no place to walk around on Jupiter. And uh, I've, I create this big room with a, with a giant cloud inside the room. And when you walk in, you hear thunder and lightning, but you can't see any of the lightning. But people can't help themselves. They have to take out their cell phone to look at anything these days. And it turns out that I have lots of infrared lights underneath that you can't see with your eyes, but your cell phone can pick up. So the only way for you to see the lightning is through your cell phone. So it deals with the, the various instruments that uh, scientists use to see the things that are invisible. And we're trying to get a sense of the depth of uh, the storms on Jupiter. We're trying to get a, a sense of structure. And so I project different kinds of projections on it that give you a sense of um, kind of cutting up into little pieces. And then again, the name of the mission is called Juno, J-U-N-O. And every once in a while, you get to see words pop up. Typography on fog is a lot of fun. So um, for the last few months, I've been, um, or maybe the last couple of years, really, I've been thinking about a new project. Turns out that um, the spacecraft, when it gets to Jupiter, it orbits 33 times. And then, bef uh, then right after its 33rd orbit, it, it, uh, it turns and it just falls into the planet because we don't want it to run into one of the moons of Jupiter and contaminate it. And so it really does 33 and a third orbits. 
And so uh, working on a, a music project where we would uh, work with a bunch of musicians, beam it to Jupiter, beam it back, but when it gets beamed back, it would actually be encoded with data from Jupiter, like the magnetosphere, or you know, different storms, different things like that. And then uh, what happens is that um, the spacecraft orbits every 11 days, and the idea is that every 11 days, uh, it would send a code to your app, and it would unlock one track. So every 11 days for 33 and a third weeks, you would get music, uh, world releases uh, from NASA and these artists. So we'll, we'll see if that comes to be. Uh, I also get to work with a lot of the people developing new mission concepts. And we, uh, I got to work with them on this new uh, sort of innovation brainstorming center, and we called it Left Field. So the ideas come out of Left Field. And uh, JPL, is full, it, it, a lot of it was built in the 60s. It's very um, uninspiring, let's <laughs> just say, when you go into one. I see your head nodding back there. Uh, you've probably been in one of them. And so uh, this is sort of a, a place where, where they're allowed to have crazy ideas and allowed to you know, think differently. And so we, we've kind of uh, tried to create an atmosphere for that and uh, you know, kind of grabbing lots of little things. And when we first put this together, everyone wanted these little toys to play with. And then we realized the engineers were really nervous to use them in various ways. And so we've actually had to do studies where I have a team of other artists working with me where we're showing them, you know, this is how you can, you know, use these little things just like a little kid would, but create, you know, future spacecrafts. And so they're, they're there talking about the spacecraft that they want to send to wherever. And then we're sort of building these objects and saying, you know, is this it? Is this, is this what you're talking about? Oh, yeah. So instead of sitting there with their CAD program, which isn't going to give them the real time it's not going to be as quick as something like this. And so that's been a lot of fun. Just finally, um, uh, sometimes being in a place like this is, is very special. JPL is a very special place. And uh, this is the rocket that launched the Juno spacecraft. And uh, there was a project manager who was, um, who was really well uh, liked, very loved at JPL. And he passed away about a year before, I, I can't remember exactly, but uh, sometime before the launch. And I was asked um, if I could make a little memorial for the, uh, for the, for the guy. And, and uh, I was like, great, I could do that. And then they said, OK, well, you have two weeks, and it has to be flight ready. It can't be any bigger than this. It can't be any thicker than that, and it can only be aluminum, and it can only be, and there's no color, there's no this, no that, and uh, giving me lots of requirements. And so uh, I was kind of nervous about this because I, I wanted to do something special that his wife would care about. And, uh, you know, lots of memorials or you kind of put a picture on it or something like that. And, and I was nervous, so I, I, I called her up. I didn't know her, um, but I felt like I needed to talk to her. And she um, it turned out that he, they both had this really quirky sense of humor. Uh, he was in the military, and so he'd had lots of very somber remembrances. And so we, we felt like we wanted to do something that was a bit more lighthearted. And uh, so it turns out that he loved to go RVing. And so we kind of used that as the, uh, the basis here uh, of his life. And so he loved to go to Hawaii. Uh, he was a captain in the military, and this is a captain symbol right there. He was an equestrian. Uh, he, he was a soccer coach. This is a, a, one of the bumper stickers that they have. This is a, an armadillo. I know it's really hard to tell, but it's an armadillo. And so it really you know, kind of um, dealt with his, with his life, and it was something that was very special for his wife. And uh, what's kind of amazing is that it's, it's on its way to Jupiter right now.